All right. Well, what's going on, everybody? Are we having a good night so far? Man, these are my favorite midweek services of the semester because it's just so cool to see what God's doing in our church and how we're responding to that. Um, and I'm so glad that you were able to be here tonight. It's super fun. Um, and I want to take a moment just to acknowledge, you know, we're, we're really about building family. And what that looks like is we actually build families. You got to see parent and child dedications tonight. You've seen uh, people making a decision to follow Christ. But there's another group um, of the family, another person in the family that I care very much about, and I'm sure you do as well, and that's our students. And, um, and for those of you who don't know, we've actually had all of our uh, students that come regularly on Wednesday nights, we've been doing a discipleship course together for the last three months uh, called 252. And uh, this course is basically a foundation to the faith, um, talking about what it looks like practically to to train your mind to think more like God. And we've been working on that. And man, I, I was putting the pressure on them, like, make sure you complete your entire workbook. Make sure that you get involved on a serve team. And I'm excited to say that um, all 11 of our students graduating tonight have done that. And so students, go ahead, come up to the stage. Y'all just come up, all you guys. Yep, just come up on stage. Just come on up. Yep. Come on up. Yep. Make a line right here. Make a line. Make a line. Perfect. Perfect. And let me just tell you, some of these students have done it before and they wanted to do it again because the first time it was, they didn't really get anything out of it. They didn't put their heart into it, and they came back and did it again. So uh, Javier Littlefield, let's give it up for him right here. Leighton Pratt, Leighton Pratt. This is uh, Lizzie Elpin. Got Sofia Diaz right there. Avea, there you go. Desira, there you go, right there. There you go, Neil. Yep. And this is Kaya right here, Kaya. And her brother Colton, who, by the way, they've been doing a great job out there with our fundraiser, getting rid of some chili cheese dogs. Oh, yeah. And then we've got Grace over here. Where's Trey? Trey, oh, you're all the way up. There you go, brother. There you go, man. Hey, and last but not least, Adriel. Adriel Garza. So, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm so proud of you guys. Uh, just me here. Don't worry about them. That's okay. I am so proud of each of you for really putting your heart into those reflect and write assignments. I read every single one. And let me just say, it's so cool to see that God, you're not just filling out a workbook, but you're really letting the Lord change your mind, change the way that you think on things, change the way that you do uh, schoolwork even. And it's really cool to see. I'm going to just pray over you guys. And if you all would just extend your hands towards them as I pray, this is a prayer from all of us. But Lord, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our students, God. And we recognize that they are not the next generation. They're the now generation. And God, we just pray that as they simmer on what they've learned in this course, God, that you would just continue to challenge them, continue to equip them, God, uh, so that they can have a biblical worldview, biblical truths that wouldn't just be something they know, but that's hidden in their heart, Lord so that they can fight the good fight of the faith. Every room that they go to, I pray that they would light it up based on the Holy Spirit that's working in them and through them. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Let's give it up for them one more time. Y'all can head back to your seat. Go ahead. Y'all can jump back over there. And you're going to be seeing all these students. Oh, yeah, you guys can go. Go ahead. Yeah, they can head back to their seat. No worries. Y'all are awesome. You're going to see them serving around the building here uh, and, and helping out on Sundays and, and Wednesdays just as they already do. Um, but it's super exciting. Now, uh, tonight I want to continue this conversation of family. And obviously we're in the holiday season, constantly surrounded by family, thinking about family, getting gifts for family. Some of us don't want to talk to our family sometimes. Can I be real? And I want to continue the conversation because this season is not just about our biological family and who we gather around the fire with. This is really a time to really think about spiritual family and, and what that means for our church. And maybe you've noticed on the big blue wall there in the commons that 
we have two big ideas here, which is we want to reach people. We want to evangelize and, and teach the gospel. But at the same time, we also want to build people. We want to build the family of God. That's what we're doing here, and that's what it's all about. And the truth is, I believe you can't understand God's plan and his purpose for your life outside of that family, outside of those relationships. And tonight, I want to ask you, if you've got a Bible with you, you can open it up to Ruth, book of Ruth. And that's going to be in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. There you go. Right there. I would, I would be lying if I told you that I wasn't singing the song in my head from Vintage Kids, trying to make sure I had it right. And we're going to look at this story of Ruth because this really shows how divine relationships are something that God calls us to have. Now let's read this together. This is starting in chapter 1, verse 1, right from the get-go. It says, In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. And their two sons were Malan and Kilian. Now they were... Uh, Ephrathites, sorry, that one messes me up every time I read it, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died. That's all he gets. <laughs> Elimelech died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. And the two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman, uh, one married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. Then about 10 years later, both Malan and Killian died. That's all they get. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. So to understand the context of what God's doing through the story, we have to think through some of these uh, clues that we get about the times that they're living in. The first is this. It begins by opening up and saying, It was the days when the judges ruled Israel. This was not a happy time. This was not a time of, of joy. This was a dark period in history. And at this moment, there's a famine in Israel. And so to find food and find a new life, Elimelech takes his wife and two sons. He leaves Bethlehem, which is known as the house of bread, and heads down to Moab. And the family settles in Moab, and his two sons marry the Moabite women, which is Ruth and, uh, Ruth and Orpah. And it also says, this left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. So Naomi didn't just lose her family, she lost her future. Her future as a woman in this culture was directly tied to the man that she was with. And so this story opens up with sin. It opens up with chaos and, and calamity. Marked, it marked the people of God during this time. And tragedy and death is where this book begins. And then here comes Ruth. Ruth enters the chat, as the Gen Z would say. And she's the least likely candidate for any type of inclusion in the purposes of God. She's a Moabite woman, okay, and, and young and an impoverished widow. She came from Moab, right? She was actually, Moab, uh, Moab was a, 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 a pagan land. So one that did not honor God at all. It would have been a sign of disobedience and compromise uh, to, to marry her of all the people that you could choose from. But yet God used her because she understood something about God that so many of us miss. So many Christians and believers in the church miss. And here's just kind of the big summary of the book of Ruth. You can go back and read the entire thing. This is only uh, four chapters. We can do that. Four chapters. That's good. We can handle that. Read the whole thing this week yeah, before Sunday. We can do that. And so the man's widow, Naomi, now has no husband, no sons, and two daughters-in-law. Both daughters love Naomi, okay? And they wept, but she insisted that they stay in Moab while she went back to Bethlehem. And reluctantly, one of them goes back, but one of them clings to Naomi, and that would be Ruth. As you read the story, you're going to see that Ruth uh, stays. She sticks with Naomi. And 
uh, Ruth goes and asks for help from one of Naomi's relatives. The relative turns out to be a man of, of great character. His name was Boaz. And over time, they fall in love. They get married. They have a son named Obed. And we're going to dig deeper into that in a moment. Uh, they go back and uh, they're, they're looking for food. Again, they're back in Bethlehem. Uh, they heard that there was going to be food there. So they decided to go back. They go back to that land and she's uh, harvesting in a field that belonged to Boaz. And Boaz, Boaz literally tells her, hey, stay in my field. In this field, there's going to be protection from, from, the, the, from the men. There's going to be provision. The, these other women harvesters, they're going to take care of you. And there's going to be companionship too. And man, I think this is just a little picture of what spiritual family ought to look like. That in spiritual family, we have relationships. There's provision. We take care of one another. How many of you heard the phrase, it takes a village? And then lastly, there's protection in the family. And you're probably saying, okay, that, that's a pretty good story. I've heard all of this before. And unless you're a widow or you're just like ancient Middle Eastern romantic comedies, you're probably thinking, what do I, what do I get out of this? And Ruth's story has something to say to us. Her life is shouting to our culture of brokenness, our culture of, of isolation. That's when I laugh when people believe in an actually progressive society, right? Or a progressive view of Scripture. Society doesn't get better over time. It gets worse. We thought that creating the Internet and social media was going to connect people more, but it didn't. Did the exact opposite. Here's some statistics that just kind of blow my mind. In the year spanning late 2019 to the late 2020, Gen Z individuals were two to three times more likely than other generations to report thinking about, planning, or attempting suicide. Approximately 11.5% of youth, translating to over 2.7 million, experienced severe major depression. And some of the... Con uh, contributors to this loneliness that we see, not just in my generation, but others, is overstimulation. So many things trying to grab your attention all at once. You also see social media taking a big, big influence, increasing loneliness, comparison, the thief of joy. You've also got a dependency shift. Uh, long ago, we used to lean into relationships. When we needed to know something or needed sugar, we just went and asked the neighbor. We didn't door dash it. When we needed advice, we went to the person that we trusted the most. Now we go to Google. So I've got this, you know, weird bump on my back. What's going on? I hope it's not anything serious. You have cancer. Oh, thanks, Google. Right? We're more virtually connected than ever before, but now relationally and emotionally more distant than ever before. You can have great physical health, great grades, make more money than you could ever spend. But if your relationships aren't, aren't right, life is miserable. And so tonight, I want to talk about principles of spiritual family from the book of Ruth. Here's some things that if you go back and you read this this week, these are some themes that you're going to see. The first is this. Look for family before looking for food. That's the first one. Ruth 1.1, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man named Beth, from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. Naomi's husband took his family to Moab to go find food. But what Naomi got was so much better than food. She got a relationship that changed her life forever through Ruth. A connection was made. Ruth found God's family. So, so sometimes we're so desperately like, hungry, and we, and we live in a culture that is so consumeristic. It's easy to think that way. Anybody else, like, when you're hungry, that's all that you can think about? <laughs> oh, that's me, man. My wife, May, she's like, so, so what is the plan for tomorrow? I'm like, I don't know, I'm just hungry. Anybody else? We can be so hungry for something, but we've got to set our hearts on God. What does he have for me? What, what is in his family for me? Some of you may not know this. Pastor Stephen was literally adopted into a physical family that was first spiritual family for him. It was through the church family, the spiritual family, that God redeemed his life. 
And that is why that's such a pivotal aspect of our, of our culture here. Because we're not just building an organization, not just building a church. We are building the family of God. Here's the second thing. Get ready to write this down. Spirit is thicker than blood. Spirit is thicker than blood. Ruth wasn't related. She was married in. And, and here's what she says during that moment of saying, I'm going to stay with you. Here's what she says. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. That's a big deal. Remember, she comes from a pagan land, false idols, false gods. She's saying, you know what? I'm going to submit to whatever you believe. Let's see what your God can do. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Again, another bold statement. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. That persistence, she couldn't get rid of it. The Bible says that Ruth clung to her. This is the moment in Ruth's story where everything changes as a result of this choice because she gets something. She gets a revelation of God's spiritual family. Naomi didn't force her to go. Naomi didn't hold a gun to her head and say, hey, you have to do this. I can't be alone. She's chasing something that she really can't describe at this point. She's ready to give up everything for this God she barely understands, Ruth. She's willing to just go for it. Why does God do it this way? Because we grow together. We grow together. Here's number three. The family of God is multi-generational. This is also important. You'll notice as you read this story, it's the same God. What you'll notice is that he's actually not mentioned in this story. One of the few in the Old Testament where God is not um, explicitly saying something. But, of course, when we really read, we can see that he's divinely orchestrating and providing for this family from cover to cover. You might remember he's actually the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of multiple generations. This is key to understanding what we're doing here at at Vintage. You know, when I first got here to um, the church back in 2018... I started looking for a church in the area that I was going to be going to school. And so I made the trip up and I came to Vintage first. And I got here and um, my, my first time getting here, I met this lady who was just beaming with love and joy. And she welcomed me with open arms, never met her once in my life. And she started calling me son like the next week. It's like... I'm not, I'm not your son. I mean, you're great, but what, what was your name again? And she, I'm not sure who, if you can tell who I'm talking about. This is Andrea Womack. Yeah, it is. And I quickly recognize that at the time, there seemed to be a lack of college-age students at the church. And at first, I thought that was a little weird. But you know what I realized over time is that that wasn't an accident. Because what every college kid wants to do, honestly, is just get around other college students so that they can get married. (laughs) Or just find their girl. Or just because it's easier to connect in that environment. But what what, what I noticed is that this was an intentional value of this house. Which is that we are a church of grandparents, parents, and kids. You're going to see it all. And really, this is something we see in the New Testament when we see three different types of relationships in Scripture that every Christian needs to have in order to continue growing. This is something I didn't know. But here it is. The first is this. Every Christian needs a Paul who is leading. Write that down. Every Christian needs a Paul who is leading. People uh, uh, use this family language a lot, spiritual father. This is someone that you don't need. Sorry, you need, but they don't need you. This is someone that you can trust more than yourself. There's been times where I've, I've jumped on a call with, with a Paul in my life. I wasn't thinking straight. I couldn't trust my own perception of the things that were happening to me, but I needed to be checked. I needed to be reminded who I really was. And my Pauls did that for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul is describing this relationship. He says, For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you only have one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. 
This is so important. I love YouTube. Okay, I love podcasts. I love Bible-based channels that, that, you know, teach how to defend the faith and stuff. I love that kind of stuff. But the truth is you can't be fathered by a podcast any more than a baby can be raised by an iPhone. Can't happen. You need a Paul in your life that says this isn't you. This is you. Here's the next one. Everyone needs a Barnabas who is loving. A Barnabas who is loving. We really uh, hit this one in in 252. A, A friend or several friends who are with you, actually with you, actually encouraging you, actually know the direction you're trying to head and want to help you stay aligned with that. Right? Acts 11, verses 20 through, 22 through 24. When the church at uh, Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. That's what we need. See, you've got to have friends and close relationships that are actually adding value to your life. I'm not just talking about the people that you talk to at the lunch table. I'm not just talking about the small talk at work. I'm saying, who are the people who are going to answer that prayer request? They're going to say, you know what? I got you. I'll pray right now. I'll send you the prayer right now. Who are the people that have your back when you need a ride? I know that's practical, but like sometimes we seriously need help. Spiritual family comes through. Who's got, who's got your side when you're dealing with grief? These are the relationships that we have to have in place that keep us aligned. Man, we were desperate for some of these relationships when May and I first got married. We went from this Bible college culture where we had an abundance of Barnabases but no Pauls. Then we got here and it was a season of like, man, we've got lots of Pauls. Pastor Stephen's great. Pastor Kyle is great. But we didn't have many Barnabases. And man, we, what we did was we jumped in a small group with uh, the Hodges right here, the Hodges. We jumped in a small group with them. And we started getting some of those relations. Everyone was older than us. I'll say that. But they were Barnabases to us. We needed the iron that sharpened our iron. Here's number three. Everyone needs a Timothy who is learning. Students, you guys aren't kids anymore. The kids are out there. They're watching you. I remember growing up, I used to say, and I hope this isn't recorded. I used to say, frick, all the time. I said, frick, all the time. And my parents kept going like, stop saying that. You're going to teach your younger brother to say that. Because I have a little brother named Luke, and he just repeat, uh, he repeated everything I said. And that's exactly what it looks like in the church. There's someone always watching you always learning from you. You may only have one or two spiritual fathers, but you can have a lot of sons and daughters to set the example for. Now, here's the last thing that we see about this story of Ruth. This is number four. Spiritual family makes an eternal impact. An eternal one. You might be meeting a practical need one time. You might be helping someone in a moment with what they need right then. But when we do it for the Lord, it's eternal. When we do it for Him, it outlasts us. We're able to build a legacy that way. Pastor Daniel hit this really well last week, talking about the fact that Jesus existed before coming as a baby. He was there at the beginning, and He will be there at the end. Right? He's eternal. And when we look at this story... We see Jesus in this story. Did you know Jesus is in every single book of the Bible? It doesn't just start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. No, he's in every, every book. And in this book, in the book of Ruth, we see an aspect of Jesus' character in Boaz. What we would call him is the kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? The kinsman redeemer for Naomi was, was Boaz in that he decided to marry into her family to preserve her future to protect her, to keep track of her property so that everything wouldn't be lost. You know, that's what Jesus does for us. In that he says, you know what? I know your family's a little crazy. You've been through a lot, but I'll take on your baggage. I'll take on your weight. I'll bless you. Naomi was taken care of and she had a future. And that's how the truth unfolded. When you read Matthew, it starts off with the genealogy of how what, the family, how you got to Jesus Christ. 
Here's what it says in verses five, five through six. So Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz, there he is, whose mother was Rahab, Gentile prostitute. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. Yes, slingshot King David. (laughs) David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Now, most people skip over the genealogies in the Bible. A bunch of names, we get it. Get me to the cool miracles and the stuff that Jesus says and did. Sermon on the Mount. This genealogy is really important. This is so important. That Matthew is picking uh, uh, selected names to emphasize what God was doing from the get-go. He picks Ruth and Boaz. Why? Because she understood something about God and spiritual family. Her grandson would go on to write this in Psalm 68, verses 5 through 6. Father to the fatherless. Probably hearkening back to, to his family members, right? Father to the fatherless, defender of the widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. That's worth celebrating. That is exactly what happened in the story of his grandparents, parents, great-grandparents, seeing what God did through them. You can be lonely in a crowd surrounded by people. What God's saying is that we've all been created to be a part of spiritual family. We're hardwired for these relationships. See what Paul says uh, about the church. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, but our bodies have many parts and God's put each part just where it belongs. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can, can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Spiritual family makes an eternal impact. A rich life is found in relationships inside of this family. I firmly believe that. I've seen that. I moved here with no family here. No family at all. But guess what? When I leave here, I will be leaving a family behind. Because I've got family here now. You'll never be an empty nester in spiritual family. There will always be a Timothy that, Really could use some advice. Really could use some help. Now, when, when a group of people together uh, come and they have one heart, one mind, they're unified on this, that's where the eternal impact happens. And as we end tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in our student ministry. Because listen, we have a lot going on and we could use some help. But it's more than just fulfilling a practical need. It is way deeper than that. We saw kids coming to camp last summer, distant from God. Let me me tell you this. We had a couple of students that the day they were leaving for camp found out their parents were going to be separated. You know what? They could have reacted a certain way, and they didn't. Why? Because of what was talked about at camp. It spoke directly to that situation, and guess what? They're strong. They stayed strong for their family. Parents, to this day, are working it out. They're both serving at their local church. Parents are serving. Kids are serving. Eternal impact. That's what I'm talking about. And as I lead our student ministry here at the Harker Heights location, we have a few opportunities. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, man, I've never really like thought to to help with students before. Maybe I, I don't really know if I have a Timothy Someone that I'm really helping lead and because I, I, went, I learned it the hard way. Maybe they don't have to learn it the hard way. And so there's a few opportunities that you can do that. The first thing is this. We have our, our student night coming up here. This is Feliz Navidad. And this is a fun event. But really, again, it's an opportunity to engage students. And maybe you're looking for a way to do that. And we've got it for you. The next thing is this. I'm really excited. Again, summer camp was so impactful last year. I know it's going to be impactful again this year, and I'm opening it up to the church. If you're a member of a serve team, you should come to camp. First of all, the pictures are crazy. You might have tie-dye all over your face, I'm just going to say, but this is a time where you can really set the tone for a student that could actually set the tone for the rest of their life. A moment that may 
completely course correct so many things from happening, all because you said yes. Uh, I want to do this. Let's go ahead and take a look at, at this video and give you a little more information about camp. Hey church family, we are super excited to announce that Vintage Student Summer Camp 2024 registration is now open. Camp happens every summer and students from each of our locations are invited to attend. Students, we have a blast at summer camp. We've got games packed into the camp programming as well as services that include worship and messages. When you get to camp, you're gonna be added to a tribe that competes in tribal wars and ultimately compete for a prize at the end of camp. Parents, we hope that camp would not just be an emotional high that students feel, but a time of preparation so that they can face the everyday struggles of a middle school and high school student. So we invite students to come and leave their responsibilities, their routines, even their cell phones at home, just so that they can come to camp and focus on growing closer to Jesus while they're there. Church family, you can be a part of helping send a student to summer camp by participating in fundraisers and giving throughout the year. There's gonna be multiple opportunities for you to play a part, a small part, in just helping a student know Jesus better by attending summer camp. And I wanna challenge you to be a part of that. Students and parents, if you are ready to sign up for camp, I just wanna encourage you to go ahead and register and lock your spot for camp. Space is limited. We are bringing more students than last year, but I wanna make sure that you get your spot. If you have any other questions about camp, uh, about dates, pricing, discounts, and so much more, you can head to our website at vintage.church slash camp. Students, we cannot wait to see you next summer. Yeah, super excited for that. You guys going? Y'all going to camp? Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, and then, you know, I, I know I mentioned in the video, there's several different ways that you can help support um, our students uh, in a in a with your time or even with your finances. But this is related to time. We're actually hosting. We are operating and managing this fireworks stand right outside the building. Um, and on the low side, on the low side, um, we could easily be raising seventy five hundred dollars towards summer camp. On the high side we could be raising nearly $15,000 for summer camp, which opens up, yeah, so many opportunities to bless students that can't afford to go, uh, give them a chance to get to go if they come from a family. Maybe that's going to be a little difficult to send your students to camp or families that have multiple students that want to go to camp. And this is just one way, and you can head to that registration there. You can talk to me after service. Um, I'd love to help you see if there's any availability you have leading up to uh, Christmas to come and join us over at the stand to help us sell some fireworks. But let me end by saying this. The church is a family, amen? Church is a family. It takes a village. But it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Because when I see this student that all he wanted to do was play video games, and chill. That's it. It's all he, chill video games. That's it. That's his job description right there. Come full circle to saying, yeah, this is, this is something I need to know more about. This Bible, this scripture, this gospel, I really need to understand this. To see them go full circle, it's so worth it. So worth it. And I just want to encourage you. One act of loyalty can save, it, it saved the bloodline for Christ. What more could it do for our students today? What more could it do for the person that you work with? What more could it do for a family member at the Christmas gathering that doesn't really know the gospel? Let's bow our heads for a moment. Because ultimately, this is about the gospel. This is about Jesus. Now, what is a gospel? Well, it's good news that really starts with bad news. Which is this, that we are all sinners. Scripture says that all have fallen short of the glory of God, which means that we could try every other way to get what we want, but ultimately Jesus is the only one that can satisfy. And sin is what stands in the gap. It separates us from the Lord. And what we got to celebrate tonight is people saying, you know what? I accept the grace of God. I accept that Jesus is my Savior, 
that that sin no longer separates me, that his grace is running after me and I invite it with open arms because God is standing there with open arms. I don't know what you came here with today. I don't know what your marriage looks like or your relationship with your family looks like or what hindrances there might be from you experiencing God's love. But what I want to say today is that he's ready to pour it out on you. And so, again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you today, have you made a decision to fully surrender your life to Jesus? Fully surrender your, uh, your dreams, your will to him. To say, you know what, Lord, you can have me. I could try every avenue, but nothing will ever satisfy me like you can. I want to be close to you again. I want to know your love again. If that's you today and you want to make a decision, say, you know what? I want to leave differently than I came. And I want to, I want a shot. I want to know my Savior today. If you want to make that commitment, I just challenge you to raise your hand on the count of three, just high enough so that I can see it and I'm going to pray for you. One, two, three. Anybody right now? Yep. Yep. I see you. You can put your hands down. About eight or nine people raising their hand right now saying, I'm making a decision today. Anybody else? You are not alone in this decision. You want to turn around and, 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 and repent from your, from your sin and say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you. Okay, let's do this. Let's pray together, all together as a church family. Lord, I need you. I've tried my own ways. None of it worked. And today, I'm coming back to you. I believe you died. I believe you rose. And today, I trust you. Lead me. Guide me. Show me the next step. Thank you. And in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, let's give up. Give it up for those that raise their hand. So good.